Bibles, I want you to join me in John chapter 20 today. In John chapter 20, we're going to talk about this whole idea of an encounter in a graveyard. Now, I know that this would be way more fitting after Easter. But we're, you know what, we get so religious about certain days. The only time we preach about love is around Valentine's Day. The only time we preach about resurrection is at Easter. The only time we preach about the Holy Ghost is at Pentecost Sunday. The only time we preach about the birth of Jesus is at Christmas. And so we get locked into the whole gamma of whatever day is on the calendar, that's what we're supposed to preach. But I, I believe that if God is going to lead the church by His Spirit, then we as people have to be very sensitive. And if God wants to, wants to move us to a place of talking about resurrection before Easter or at Christmas or, or whatever day of the year, that ought to be His right. Don't you say amen to that? So I want to talk to you today about an encounter in a graveyard. So if you're in John chapter 20, let's read together. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to jump down to verse number 11 real quickly. So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went out to the tomb early while it was still dark. There's, going to be so, there's so much to preach just in that statement. Well, I'm going to hit a little bit of that right there. You, how can somebody preach on the fact that she went out there while it was still dark? This is a woman that used to be dominated by the darkness. She saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord uh, out of the tomb and we do not know where they laid him. So skip on down because they run to the tomb. And uh, so they're at the tomb, and verse number 11 says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weep, the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. I want you to pray for me. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to us in such a way that transformation will take place. You're not interested in information today, okay? You're interested in transformation. So you've got to hear with the ear of the Spirit, all right? And so that's what will bring transformation. So I want you to pray for me that I speak the words of the Spirit of God. And I'm going to pray for you that God will help us to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. Will you do that with me? Come on, pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this wonderful body of people today. I pray right now in the power of God that you would touch us and give us ears to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. God, we say the Samuel of old, speak for your servant is listening. Lord, we want to follow what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. We remind it. We're reminded that it, when you spoke to the seven churches of Asia, you said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying unto the churches. And Lord, we pray to be able to hear with the real ear, the ear of the Spirit, which brings a transformation inside of our lives so that when this day is said and done, we have moved from one step of glory to another step of glory. That we have moved from one dimension of faith to another dimension of faith. That we have moved from one dimension of spirituality to another dimension of spirituality. Father, that we move from one dimension of living to a whole new dimension of living, seated with you in heavenly places. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do today. And God, we say amen according to your word. Let it be unto us. Amen. I want you to think about this woman right here. This is a specific story dealing with Mary Magdalene. She's the first person to ever tell the resurrection story. 
I want you to think about this woman right here. This lady intrigues me. Number one, because she was mentioned more than some of the disciples in the Scripture. I mean, you, you hear about Nathaniel once or twice. You hear about Mary Magdalene all the time. Mary Magdalene is one of those interesting characters in the Scripture that scholars really kind of debate whether or not she is mentioned in certain places of Scripture that were not given clear-cut information. For instance, some people say that, and, and many Bible scholars believe that she was the woman caught in the very act of adultery. That's interesting to think about. We know for sure she's the woman whom seven devils was cast out of. We know that according to John chapter number 8, or excuse me, in Luke chapter number 8. And then John chapter 8, she could be the woman caught in the very act of adultery. Yet here she is, she's at the garden tomb, the very first one to go looking for the body of Jesus. Or going to the place where she last saw him. The last place that she saw him was being put in a tomb and the stone being rolled at the door. Here she is, this woman who many would look at her life and say, you know what, what a testimony. What a story of an individual. Think about this woman for just a moment. Let's say she is the woman caught in the very act of adultery. Did you know that the Bible that said to them the law that she was supposed to be stoned? Yet it was Jesus that on the day that she was brought by the accusers to Jesus, it was him that stooped down and took his finger and wrote up on the ground. And, and I don't know what he wrote up on the ground. All I know is that when the finger of God touched the ground the first time, it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But this time when the finger of God touched the ground, here he was willing to forgive her of what she had done. Think about this just for a moment. Here she is in a position where the Sanhedrin was around her and the prescription for her life or the sentence for her life was to be stoned. And there she is. She has been released from, from her guilt and from her shame and from her, her, her sinfulness. And I don't know about you, but that touches me because the same Jesus saw me one day in all of my dysfunction and all of my sin. And all of my mistakes and all of my failures, listen to me. All you got to do to get on fire for God once again is take a little journey back to where he found you. If you're struggling to just give God a praise, if you're struggling to live victorious, just go right back to the day that he found you. Go right back to where you were. Or go back to your last mistake. And when you made that last mistake, what did he say to you? What was he saying to you at that particular moment? Did he say, away with you, I'm done with your life? I don't have any need for you anymore. You're too much of a screw up, a mess up. I don't need you in my kingdom. Or did he say, come on back, child. I love you. This is not what I've intended for your life. I want to take care of that last mistake. And I want to reestablish you into my kingdom because I still have a plan for your life. You think I don't have a plan for your life. And the enemy told you your last mistake was the end of your ministry. But I'm telling you, I I still have a plan for your life and my grace is sufficient and if you'll repent I'll restore you back what the enemy's tried to steal from you if you're having problems living victorious for God go back and look what he's already done for you so here this lady is who 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 Mary Magdalene she she's so intriguing to me because of where she come from the thing that's said about her and when she's anointing Jesus' feet with her tears or anointing him with the spikenard and then wiping his feet with her hair and, and crying at his feet. I, I, I'm reminded of what is said about her life to the one that has been forgiven much, loves much. And, and if, you are, if you really will look back at all he really forgave you of. I mean, sometimes it's usually one mistake, two mistakes that really get us when we're talking about we need forgiveness. But when you look at really what Jesus really did for you, it wasn't just the one or two mistakes that you can think of. It's all those other things that you can't think of. It's all those attitudes that you don't even know at times you got an issue with. It's all those, uh, it's, it's the, 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 the desires of your heart that maybe he's not even dealt with yet. Oh, he will. But, but, but when he forgave you, you know, sometimes I see people come to the altar and it's usually when their marriage is wrecked. Or it might be when they've made a huge mistake, something big. It, it, it's, it's, it's the big thing. And I'm not saying it takes a big thing to get you right with God. All it takes is revelation of understanding that we all fall short of the glory of God. 
But, but, but here's the truth of the matter. When you realize and you understand how much God really has forgiven you of, when you realize that there is none righteous, no, not one, when you realize that even our righteousness is like filthy rags in the presence of God, when you realize that on your best day you still aren't good enough for a holy God, when you realize that when you've got it all together and you don't feel like you've made a mistake today, we still fall short of the glory of Almighty God yet it was that same God willing not to throw you away or discard you but to say that's the one I want to purchase I want them in my kingdom and if you'll realize how much he really has forgiven you oh the depth of the love oh the depth of the gratitude oh the depth of the commitment to this one called Jesus who paid such a huge price just for me I don't know about you but it was a big deal for me I know where he brought me from. Now, some of you may have grown up in church your whole life, and it might take you some time to try to sort through some of the religious jargon that you thought was righteousness in order to realize that when you walked in that, 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 that religious jargon, you really were missing God, and it was sin in the presence of God. When you push past all of that to realize that he did a mighty work in you suddenly this sense of praise this sense of gratefulness this sense of gratitude comes boiling from way down inside of you and think about Mary Magdalene here this woman was she's considered a woman of the night but she has seven devils possessed of devils seven of them I can't even fathom that some people don't even believe in demonic possessions anymore. In October, we're going to South America. Come on. That's all I can say. Get you 1500 bucks, and let's get on a plane, and I'll show you something. But, but, but you, you don't have to go to South America to see it. I mean, there's plenty right around here. But here she is, seven devils has possessed her life. There's a whole teaching that I believe I could give you on the relation between her promiscuous life and her demonic possessions. It's not just fun and having a little fling. <laughs> oh, I went over like a lead balloon. I got to hit that a little bit more. It's not just a little bit of fun and a little bit of fling. When you start messing around out from underneath God's covenant ways, you open yourself up to the demonic realm. That's why you will. Oh Lord, that's why you're willing to disobey your parents and mess every other relationship up in your life when you think you've you, you just found that person. But if you found the person that you don't keep in line with Scripture, you open yourself up to demonic operations that will cause you to do freaky, crazy, stupid stuff. Think about that. So here this woman is. She's been possessed of the devil, but geez, she meets one called Jesus. I'm so thankful for meeting. I, I can't hit that enough. For what he's done in me. I, I can't get over the fact. Man devils were talking to me. Before Jesus got a hold of me. Do you understand that? I, I mean that's where the thought came from. For me to commit suicide. Was from the very pit of hell. Devils were oppressing me. Life around me was a mess. But when I knelt down. At the, the feet of Jesus Christ. And he forgave me. He not only forgave me, but he put on the run those devils that had plagued my life, that had taken me down, that had taken me down such a path that I was convinced suicide was my only way out. I don't know if there's anybody in here ever contemplated suicide, but if you have, I want you to know it's a devil talking. I want you to know that it's the very demon of hell talking to try to take you out and to tell you that God doesn't have a plan 
plan for your life. But there's one named Jesus. Oh, there's somebody named Jesus who that when he walks into the midst of your situations, demons tremble. I'm telling you, when the man at the Sea of Gadarene, you know this story if you've been in church very long. The man on the coast of the Sea of Gadarene, so full of devils, the Bible says that he was possessed by legion, which means many. There was a multitude of demons in this guy, so jacked up that he had stripped off all of his clothes and they couldn't even hold him with chains. He could break the chains. Messed up from the floor up, but oh, when Jesus stepped out of the boat, listen to me. You know one of the first persons that began to talk was not the man, but the devils that were in him. They began to say, oh, Jesus, have you come to torment us for the time? You know what that tells me? That G the demons are afraid of Jesus. Demonic forces are afraid of Jesus. Oh, but when you call on the name of Jesus, remember when we used to be located over on Norfolk Avenue? We had the, the little church building over on Norfolk Avenue. My pastor, when he pastored the church, I remember he used to say, he would make statements something like that, and he said, man, I begin, I can see, I'd see his little body go to shake. And I say, little body, he's a pretty good-sized fella. <laughs> but he had little short legs. I'd see him begin to shake like that. And he'd say, brother, I used to say, I can see him now. I can see when we invoke the name of Jesus. I can see the devil. He's running up to the end of Norfolk Avenue. He's taking a right turn right there. And he's gone on up just a little bit bit till he get, gets over on, on, on Old Airport Road. But I see him starting up Old Airport Road, but he's turning right at Shakespeare Road. And he's going up Shakespeare Hill. And he's going across the other side. Oh, he's found the perfect place. It's the dump. And he's dove off in it. <laughs> It made for good preaching. I don't know if that was the total reality, but it made for good preaching. What I can tell you, though, is that Jesus has authority over every demonic force. Now think about this for a moment. Demonic forces is often associated with darkness in Scripture. The kingdom of darkness. We once were in darkness, without light, without hope. The kingdom of darkness is, is known for the place where the demonic and fleshliness thrive. It's the place where the enemy can talk to your flesh man and get you to do about anything he wants you to do. It's in that dimension, in that realm, that darkness is, is, is the relation. Now here we are, Mary Magdalene. It's very dark. It's early in the morning. And, and let me tell you something, other, something else about demonic forces. They often find a place to thrive... In dead places. <laughs> oh, I could take that in a different place. <laughs> I'm going to be careful, though. I'm just going to tell you, don't ever be a dead church. <laughs> I don't want to hyper-spiritualize that in any way, but all I can say is just don't, don't ever get to a dead place. The enemy thrives among the tombs. So here she is, walking into a place that used to own her. A place that used to, to dominate her life. Now here she is. She's, she's in, the, in the darkness. And she's going among the tombs. And, 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 and have you ever been in a place in your life? I want you to think about this Mary Magdalene again for a, mo a moment. Here's all that God has done for her. Jesus has forgiven her of her adultery. Jesus has cast out seven devils in her life. This woman is free. She follows him for the majority of his ministry. She's there at the crucifixion. But it's there at the crucifixion. I want you to think about it for a moment. The one who forgave her all of her hopes and dreams in front of her face, what she sees at face value looks like it's being taken away. Have you ever tried to put yourself in the position that if you were there on the day that Jesus was crucified? And listen to the taunts of those soldiers and the Sanhedrin council and the high priest. When they said, come down off of that cross and we'll believe you. Now you're there. Put yourself in Mary Magdalene's shoes. You know that he raised, you know that he raised her brother from the dead, right? You know that she understood his power, his ability to multiply loaves and fishes. 
his ability to walk on water. She, she's heard the stories, and she's been there for a lot of the miracles that Jesus had done. And she's standing there, hearing this taunting, knowing that if he comes off of that cross, he could prove it to everybody standing there. I don't know about you, but if it would have been me, I would have been saying, please, just do this. If you'll do this, I don't have to watch you die. You're the one that give me hope. You're the one that give me life. I have enjoyed following your ministry, and I want to follow you. Please come off of there. Come off of the cross. Show them. Yet he doesn't. He dies. Not only does he die, he's lowered down off of the cross, and she watches him be put in a tomb and the door sealed. Have you ever been in a hopeless place? Have you ever felt like out of everything that God has done in your life, and, and here's what I want to tell you. If you follow Jesus long enough, you will find a winter season in your life where you feel like, yes, I know what he's done for me, and it's been amazing, but where is he now? Don't look at me so spiritual. Have you ever walked in that place of thinking, Lord, I know what you've done for me back then, but some, my joy is all gone right now. I feel like I'm living among the tombs. Yeah, I'm still dominating in this atmosphere, but I need your presence. Yeah, those demons that used to control me, they're not back on me yet. But where are you? Yeah, I'm not back on drugs. Yes, I am not back under the control of those demonic forces, but I'm walking around in a graveyard. And life's a wreck. Some of you got a good life. You ought to be glad for it. Praise the Lord. But there's, I come by to tell somebody today. I feel like this is the whole crux of why the Lord sent me by today. I come by to talk to somebody today who you loved God at one point, you served God with all of your life at one point, and you know what all God has done for you, but right now you feel like you're walking among the tombs. In your mind... When I was preaching about all that God has done for you, you were getting back there in your mind, but somehow life for you is not like a graveyard. You feel like you're walking around in the dark. Mary Magdalene, in the midst of her darkness, trying to interpret what's happening around her, she gets there. She sees that the tomb is rolled away, yet she doesn't see the spiritual dimension. Watch this. When she even sees angels, she doesn't see the spiritual dimension. When you, listen to me, when you have been broken and disappointed enough, sometimes it's hard to see all of the things that God is really doing around you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. It's hard to see. Everybody else is shouting the praises, but you're still trying to figure out what's going on because right now it still seems like graveyards and tombs and, and death and blackness and darkness all around you. Trying to figure it all out. Here she is. She stoops down to look inside of the tomb. There's an angel sitting at the head and an angel sitting at the feet asking her the question, what are you looking for? And she says, where is his body? Tell me where it is. And then an opportunity for encounter comes to her. Oh, you better hear me. An opportunity of encounter comes to her. And she's so steeped into the disappointment and the darkness that she doesn't even recognize the one that is asking her, what are you looking for? Who are you seeking here? She interprets the voice of being the gardener. And why wouldn't she? 
I mean, the gardener would be the expected person taking care of the yard work and the accoutrements of the graveyard. She ex And there's a whole other teaching we could go down there. I'm not going to go there today. But she thinks that it's the gardener talking to her. I mean, this is a woman who day after day heard his voice. This is a woman who is very familiar, very familiar with who Jesus is. My God, so in love with Jesus, she's the very one that took that anointing oil, that spikenard, and poured it out on his feet. She, she, we know by that very story she listened to him teach. She heard him say, rebuke his disciples and say, don't touch her. Do not do this. What she is doing is a good thing. And in fact, wherever this gospel is preached, oh, good God, listen to me. Wherever this gospel is preached, I don't care if you tell about me walking on water. I don't care if you tell about me raising Lazarus from the dead. I don't care if you tell me about telling them about me feeding the five loaves and two fishes. But wherever this gospel is preached, I want you to tell this story right here. Read your Bible. I want you to tell this story right here as a memorial to her. I want you to accentuate the fact that she felt like that I was worth her whole year's wages. And that she was willing to pour it all over my life. And you think it's just being emptied out. And you think something else is worth more. And Judas, you think it could have been used for the poor. But she's poured it all over me. Have you found a love that is worth everything that you can pour out to him? If you haven't found Jesus in a way that you're willing to pour it all out for him, you've not found the real one yet. God, help me. Help me to preach Jesus in such a way that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is so revealed to you that you're willing to say, whatever it takes, I'll follow him the rest of my life. Whatever it costs, even at the cost of my very life. One of these things all the time. Listen, listen. I know she was among the tombs, but she was still seeking him out. I'm not saying we don't go through trials and tests. But I'm talking about that, you know, those, those, those seasons where you go five months and you never pray. Six months and you only crisis pray. You know what crisis praying is? Nothing wrong with crisis praying because we all have to crisis pray. But if that's the crux of our prayer life, I'd say you don't have a prayer life. Crisis praying. The next tragic event has happened in your life, so now it moves you to prayer. There's so much more to being with God than crisis praying. In fact, I despise crisis praying because I feel like I'm asking him for more than what he's already done at times. Now, he expects me to crisis pray. Yes, he does. And with all prayer and supplication, let my request be made known to God. Yes, he hears me when I'm in crisis mode. He hears me when I'm saying, God, help me. But listen to me. The, be the beauty of prayer is not crisis praying. It's being with him. It's in his presence. The highest acquisition of prayer is God. You can't acquire anything any higher in prayer than his presence. I don't, give, I don't care if it gives you $10 million. It's not worth his presence. Come on, somebody. God, help me to reveal this Jesus in such a way that he is attractive, who he really is, the kind of Jesus that the disciples was willing to face any trial and test in order to just have his glorious presence with them. Now, let's go back to Mary Magdalene here for a moment. Here she is, she's in the garden tomb, or she's, she's in the tomb, near the tomb. She stoops down, excuse me, she doesn't recognize a spiritual moment. I don't know, personally, if I've ever seen angels. Some of you may have. I don't know that I have. I, I am so intrigued by the things of the Spirit and the things of God that I almost feel like I'd lay hands on myself and go out in the Holy Ghost if I saw angels. <laughs> I would like to think that I would recognize that spiritual moment of visitation. 
I, I truly believe I have heard the audible voice of God. I, I told you that story before. I believe it was in a very protective way. I didn't recognize it as the audible voice of God at first. But I truly believe I heard the audible voice of God. Here she is not recognizing that it's Jesus speaking to her until he says her name. Until you can hear this for you and hear God talking to you, today could be a missed moment. Don't stay in amongst the tombs. And not hear this for you. You've heard a thousand sermons. Maybe ten thousand. Hear the one that's to you today. Life amongst the tombs. Doesn't have to stay that way. Let me give you a couple of things quickly. Everybody okay? Slap your neighbor and tell them to wake up. A couple of things that's very interesting to me about this woman. Before we conclude this, I'm going to give you a couple of things that's, in, that's that, that just so intriguing. I feel like we could preach probably for about three or four months just on her life and learn so many things about walking with God. One is that if you notice, Mary Magdalene was not her last name. It actually is a reference from the region from which she came. On the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. A town called Magdala. Now think about this just for just a quick moment. The name Magdala means, in Aramaic means a tower. Elevated, great, magnificent. No wonder, no wonder he refused to let her be the demoniac harlot that she was when he found her. Provided that the scholars are right that says that she was the woman called in the act of adultery. I don't know if she is. I don't know if she isn't. I just know that's the same God that I serve. Nevertheless, it, whether her name, this, this woman that he forgave is Mary or not is irrelevant. The relevancy is the fact that he forgave her. But if it is Mary, you have to understand that there was an intention for her life. An intention of a being a great, magnificent, elevated tower. Yet here she is thrown upon the ground by her accusers. God's plan wasn't over with her life. I think we could spend some time right there, but I'm not going to. I just want to give you a little bit of food for thought. Let me give you another food for thought. If she, in fact, was the woman caught in the very act of adultery, if you go over and look in the book of Proverbs, you'll find that one of the things of a seducing woman is the scent. It's specifically spoken of in the Proverbs. The scent, the aroma. She adorns herself and then aromatically puts aroma in order for attraction. Esther was a, a, a person who, because of the cleansing process, aromatic aromas was used to attract the king when she was taken before the king. How many remember the story? I think it's interesting that here the woman who had the, her livelihood in this spikenard in terms of used it for the attraction of others. Now says, I'm not attracted to anything else but him. I'm no longer going to pour out a fragrance to find me a love because I have found one that is better than 10,000. And I'm willing to pour it out all on him. I think that's an interesting thing.
The perfume spikenard used on Jesus could have once been used to attract other men with which she once committed harlotry. Now once redeemed is used to show the depths of the gratitude of her freedom. I remember that song that when, I, I can't remember the name of it now. Shelly Grizzle used to sing it. They're not here today, but I remember she used to sing the song. And, and, and it had to do with about judging her praise and her worship. Had to do with pouring it out on the Lord. I don't even remember the whole name of the song. I just remember how the presence of the Lord would fill the place when, when she talked about pouring this out. And it had to do with this particular particular passage of Scripture. How that she poured it out upon the Lord. And really it was a story about don't judging, not judging somebody that's worth pouring it all out on the Lord. Listen to me. Next time you look at somebody that's jumping and shouting and dancing, don't just sit back and assume. Don't just sit back and assume that it is just, just fleshliness. Don't sit back and just assume that it's the uber Pentecostal. That's just crazy Pentecostals. Listen, li- 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 uh, listen to me. Whether you're Pentecostal or not, I believe that we ought to give people permission in the arena of church to celebrate Him who is worth it all. And I don't care if it's a Pentecostal church or not. We ought to give people the permission to say, don't don't judge me because I'm pouring it out. Now, again, if somebody else is there quiet and having a reflective moment with God, let's not judge that either. But at the same time, you don't know what he's done for me. You, You haven't had a walk a day in my shoes. You don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what it was like for me. The best I can do to try to explain to you where I was when he found me falls way short to try to give you the depth of my reality. But what he's done for me is so amazing. I can't get over the wonder of the fact that Jesus rescued me. And in this story, we find one who is willing to do this. The love you once... Once prepared for another, now she gives to the one that she has found that's worth them all. Here's the last thing that I want to leave you with. And then we're going to pray. Because God didn't send me by here just to tell you about Mary Magdalene and all that she went through, but tell you there's somebody here walking among the tombs today. That's exactly what it feels like for you. Praise team, can you come back? I need some landing music. I'm going to land early today because we're going to need to pray. The choir sung a little chorus the other night. I'm not going to try. I'm going to just tell them what it is. We we don't even have to try this. You may know it, but (laughs) it's a powerful song. I don't even know who sings it. I wrote down a couple of the words. It goes like this. I'm going to just sing it a little bit a cappella to you. But it goes like this. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life. So I could be free. So I could be whole, so I could tell everyone I know. Man, that choir hit that. And I thought, you thought I was worth saving. You thought I was worth keeping. You thought I was to die for. Man, that, man, that really touched my life. I want to tell you right now, you may feel like you're walking among tombs, but if you'll hear his voice right now this morning, I believe you're about to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. We're a church that preaches encounter. What does that mean? That don't mean you just go to church, hear a good sermon, and leave. That means that when we get to a place, a time, a moment, whereby God has given the revelation of what He wants to say to you, whether how deep or how simple it may be, 
there is an opportunity for you to say, yes, Lord, I hear. Not just for you to say, yes, Lord, I hear, but to, for you to move toward him. For you to say, Lord, you were talking to me. For you to say, Lord, you are speaking my name. I'm the one that's been living among the tombs. And I don't have the joy I used to have, though I can remember when you rescued me. I don't have the peace that I used to have, though I remember where I was when you found me. And I'm still seeking you. It feels like a dark moment, and I feel like I'm walking among the tombs. It may feel like that in your home. It may feel like that in your family. My God, I'm talking to somebody today. You're about to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. He's calling your name. Do you hear him? Do you hear him? No, not with these. With this. Do you hear him? Can you realize that right now you're in a dark moment and you're among the tombs? I'm not asking you, do you love Jesus? You couldn't have, you couldn't have got a greater response of, I wouldn't have been here if I had not loved him if you were to ask Mary Magdalene that very question. Do you not love Jesus? I'm here, ain't I? I love him with all my heart. But I am surrounded by darkness in a graveyard right now. And the atmosphere that I got victory over is threatening my joy and threatening my hope. And really, there has been moments for you to come out before now. Kind of like her. She saw the angels, but really didn't perceive that there was a spiritual moment in front of her. How many times have you gone to church and maybe missed a spiritual moment? A moment where your hope could be restored. And watch this. She's stooping down. She's looking in the tomb. She's just had a conversation with those angels. She hears somebody say, Who are you looking for? She supposedly is the gardener. If you know where they've taken him, can you tell me? And he hears her. He, she hears him say, Mary. And that grips her heart. Can you imagine the moment she turns around? Dear God, dear God, it's you. You're alive. My hope is not gone. The light that burst across that darkened tombs now bursting forth in her soul. The joy that floods her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet realizing that hope is not lost and he saw me right in my dark moment and he wasn't willing to go find Peter or somebody else but he came right back to where I was right in my darkest moment in the face of an empty tomb where I thought my hope was lost but here he is now he's woo. stand with me whoa Jesus Back to